almost everything we need here is in the question stem. I would, if I were, if this were on my test, I wouldn't even look at the passage at all. Alex, back for another MCAT podcast. Last week covering some discretes that uh, were a nice break from reading, but back into passage nine today for Bio Biochem. Whew, I'm ready. Oh, hello. Ready? <laughs> I am ready. Oh, I'm, all, I'm always ready for MCAT. Come on. <laughs> Says the MCAT instructor. It's a, <laughs> it's a special breed of human being that can uh, yeah. take the MCAT yeah. and go, that was just amazing and phenomenal. I want to eat, sleep, and breathe MCAT for now on for a while. Yeah, yeah. I, I've done it for the last six months. I might as, might as well just keep going. Mine so as much well. fun. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're sharing your talents with us here on the podcast. Uh, as has been the case for the last few months, uh, I've been lucky enough to be joined by several Blueprint live online instructors, and, and you are one of those instructors. And so if a student does the Blueprint live online course, they get to hang out with you sometimes if they want. That they do. <laughs> we, we, have, we, we, have, we have a great time. Yes. Or they can just, to, to simulate that, if they don't actually like you, they can just switch their Siri voice over to a British male voice. It's true. It's true. I do sometimes get students uh, jo- like dropping in the chat whenever I pronounce something kind of funnily from their perspective. Yes, it is awesome. You know, I think my, 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 uh, my beaters, I think, or uh, particularly or uh, really throw people off. Yes. Or indeed, or indeed, as we covered in the, in the discretes, I am, um, my natural inclination is to say respiratory and not respiratory. Mm, that works say aluminum aluminium <laughs> very nice all right uh let's go ahead and jump in to passage nine yeah so we've got a uh, one that's all about cancer so a major challenging fa- facing cancer research is how to create therapies that specifically target and kill cancerous cells with minimal effects on non-malignant cells one of the most promising avenues is the targeting of cancer cells metabolic profile Cancerous cells have much higher glycolytic flux, in the in parentheses, rate of glycolysis, than normal cells, due in part to their rapid growth in cell division. Malignant cells rely more on form- fermentation than normal cells. Thus, compounds that interfere with k- key glycolytic enzymes may selectively induce apoptosis in cancer cells. One example of such a compound is clotrimiz- clotrimizole, which is shown in figure one. And then it's abbreviated as CTZ, classic background passage. Yeah. So I I think this is a relatively easy beginning to this passage because it's like, yeah, I understand cancer. And we all know that I think we all know that chemotherapy is really bad because it kills lots of healthy cells as well as the cancer cells. And so how do we fix that? Yeah, exactly. I do like how it says minimal rather than none. Yeah. Um, One day, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of like broad takeaways from this paragraph, you're right. I don't think that, you know, this is like a classic background uh, paragraph. It's just, you know, setting the scene. So uh, yeah, cancerous cells have a much higher glycolytic flux. Maybe that'll be tested. Mm -hmm. Uh, Malignant cells rely more on fermentation. I can totally imagine a question on that. And then compounds which interfere with glycolytic enzymes may selectively induce apoptosis. And then, of course, I'd be tempted to highlight the name of the compound itself, uh, clotrimazole. I'm, I think I'm pronouncing this differently every time, but... Yeah, clotrimazole. Yeah, another, another, another compound that sounds kind of like a kind of pasta. <laughs> Would you like it's some itten. clotrimazole in sauce tonight? <laughs> it and all of the proton pump inhibitors. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have, a, we have figure one here. We have, the, we have its structure. And uh, it's a very pretty yeah, it's, structure. It's beautiful. Yeah. Lots of rings. It's like a four leaf clover. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I think Be- Beyonce would approve. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but in terms of, I guess, you know, just as with all structures, you know, look over it. Certainly my takeaway looking for, looking at this molecule immediately is, oh, wow, it's got a lot of aromatic rings. This is almost certainly a very nonpolar structure. It's probably very, you know, it's probably very hydrophobic. Um, you know, not a lot, not a lot of polar bonds in there. That might be relevant. It might not be. We'll see. 
Moving on, we get CTZ interferes with glycolysis, specifically with the enzymes hexokinase, phosphofructokinase, and aldolase. This causes cell cycle arrest in G1 and leads to apoptosis. I would immediately stop here because it's dropped quite a lot of specific enzyme names that I think would want to highlight. Mm. Yeah, those are, those yeah. are some big ones there. Yeah, like it interferes with glycolysis and then hexokinase, phosphofructokinase, aldolase, and then also it gives letter abbreviations for them, HK, PFK, ALD. This causes cell cycle arrests and leads to apoptosis. Yeah, absolutely. Those are some really important enzymes. So, of course, I'm, I imagine that the rest of the passage will be concerned with how it does this somehow. Mm. However, the structure of CTZ limits its tissue delivery, which restricts therape therapeutic use of CTZ. To circumvent this problem, researchers created nanomicelles embedded with CTZ. The efficacy of the nano-encapsulated version of CTZ, and then we get another abbreviation, NCTZ, presumably for nano-CTZ, was compared to that of unencapsulated CTZ, which is then given another abbreviation, UCTZ, presumably for unencapsulated, for treating human breast cancer cell line MCF7. If we stop right there, I love what they've laid out there. In just a few sentences, they've said, all right, we've got this amazing molecule, but its structure limits us giving it to cells. How are we going to fix that? What's their research? You know, what is their experiment? Oh, we've put it in these nano, we, we, we've put it in these nano micelles, uh, NCTZ, and we're comparing these, this nano encapsulated version with unencapsulated CTZ. Uh, and, we're, and what are we testing it on? We're testing it on this human breast cancer cell line called MCF7. Really like this. Problem, experimental design to try and solve the problem. This is like really classic kind of research paper writing. You know, this is the issue. This is how we're trying to go about solving it. In vitro, MCF7 cell populations were treated with identical concentrations, 50 micromolars, of NCTZ and UCTZ for 24 hours. PFK and HK activities were assayed before and after treatment to measure glycolytic ability. Cytosolic ATP concentrations were also measured. The results are shown below in table one. Enzyme activity is expressed as a value normalized to the baseline levels present without the encapsulation. All right. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> this is when they start throwing all of the abbreviations that they've already defined to you all at once and hoping that you can keep up. Yeah. So they tell us the study and then they give us the results. Yeah. Yeah. But really all these, all that group of sentences was really telling us is like, Oh, you know, we have these nano encapsulated version and we have the unencapsulated version. We just treated some cancer cells with it. And then we measured these enzyme concentrations or rather we measured these enzyme activities. Uh, so really, I mean, it's the, the design itself is relatively straightforward. But we just have to be very clear on what they're measuring, which is PFK, HK uh, activity, and ATP concentration, and how it's being expressed as a value normalized to baseline levels. So presumably we'll get it like relative to one. You know, it'll either be less than one or it'll be greater than one. Probably less, given that we're dealing with an inhibitor. Okay. We go to, we go to table one. We have a whole table of data. So we have before NCTZ treatment and after and then before you CTZ treatment and after, and then we have PFK activity, you know, as the kind of, as the columns, we have PFK activity, phosphofructokinase, HK activity, hexokinase, and the ATP concentration in the cytosol. Oh, what do you think our key takeaway from this table would be? It's a lot of numbers. It is a lot of numbers. So I, I kind of see the the important thing right is enzyme activity is expressed as a value normalized to the baseline levels and so i see number one number one for before before so that makes sense right mm -hmm. uh, i'm not quite sure why the atp here is 6.8 compared to 7.2 because those are both before treatment but i'll kind of ignore that for now 
Um, and then I see after treatment with this nano encapsulated, obviously it's going down because things aren't working as well. And yep. you see ATP production basically cut way, way, way down for this nano encapsulated versus unencapsulated. You see some decrease in PFK, not as much in HK. It's almost one. And ATP is almost exactly the same. And so yeah. I think what this table is telling us is that nano encapsulated CTZ treatment works. The encapsulation gets it into the cells, which is the issue with CTZ. I would absolutely, I would absolutely agree. Yeah. It looks like, uh, yeah. NCTZ and UCTZ probably have about the same effect on PFK, but that the UCTZ has almost no effect on HK but that only the nano CTZ, NCTZ, reduces cytosolic ATP to any reasonable degree. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we could absolutely conclude that, you know, whatever NCTZ is, it's probably a better cancer treatment. But let's see what the questions ask us, because maybe <laughs> that won't even be addressed. <laughs> Has nothing to do with that, because that's what the <laughs> MCAD does to us. <laughs> yeah. We just spent all that time interpreting that table. It turns out it actually just wants, uh, it just wants us to ask us pseudo discretes instead. That's all it is. Yeah. All right. So question 48. I'll start with that one. Positron emission tomography, PET, scans follow the movement of a radioactively labeled compound throughout, throughout the body and are often used to detect metabolic activity in cancer cells relative to normal cells. The labeled compound is most likely A, pyruvate, B, acetyl-CoA, C, ATP or D glucose. All right, so it's it's interesting because again, this is a pseudo discrete. It's like, hey, thanks for telling me all about cancer cells and all about CTZ. And at the in the end, you just want to talk about how PET scans work. So yep, we are looking at a, a radioactively labeled compound. So we have to put a compound into the body. The question is, what is it? And it tells us that it's detecting metabolic activity. And so we know from the passage, right, there's a little bit of passage information that cancer cells are more metabolically active, right? Higher glycolytic flux, a rate of glycolysis. And so it would tell me potentially that glucose would be the label because these cells are going to be taking up glucose and doing stuff with it, this glycolytic flux. I think that's how I would answer that. I would completely agree with you. Yeah. So I, in a sense, I think almost everything we need here is in the question stem. I would, if I would, if this were on my test, I wouldn't even look at the passage at all. Yeah. You know, it follows the movement of a radioactively labeled compound throughout the body. That means we're looking for a compound that moves through the body. And actually glucose is the only one of these that does. You know, pyruvate, as we know, is generated from the breakdown of glucose and glycolysis, but that doesn't circulate in the body to any meaningful extent. You know, it is transported through the body, but it's done through, uh, it, it does that as its intermediate lactic acid in the Cori cycle. Mm. Again, acetyl CoA is fed into the Krebs cycle, but again, it's almost entirely produced and consumed intracellul intracellularly. Bleh. And then C, ATP, same thing. You know, you, your cells don't pick up ATP from the blood. They produce it themselves from the glucose that they pick up from the blood. So yeah, D is the, D, D is the best answer here. Yeah. Which of the following most accurately summarizes the efficacy of NCTZ versus UCTZ against MCF7 in vitro? A, NCTZ and UCTZ are equally effective against MCF7 since they inhibit PFK equally. B, NCTZ is less effective than UCTZ because, as it is less bioavailable. C, UCTZ is more effective than NCTZ as it reduces HK activity to a greater extent. Or D, NCTZ is more effective than UCTZ as it reduces cytosolic ATP to a greater extent. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So this seems like we already answered this question because we kind of summarized what we read in the table, I think. 
by saying, hey, this NCTZ treatment did the best at reducing ATP, which tells me, hey, that's effective because it's killing the cells. It's not making ATP anymore. Or it's it's kind of arresting the um, whatever metabolic stuff is going on. So answer choice D is the one that answers that the same way that we answered it, I think. Yep, yep. And that's a great way to use predictions on the sciences section, which is question 49 is effectively saying, like, what does table one show us? Yeah. Um, I guess the key kind of the key conceptual leap that we had to make, which, you know, which you just made immediately was that, you know, what output are we interested in as efficacy against cancer cells? You know, is it PFK activity? Is it HK activity? No, it's actually ATP concentration. That's the most direct output for, you know, handicapping which one of these is most likely to make the cell die. Well, ultimately, HK activity, you know, that's just hexokinin, that's just an enzyme. But if the cell, if the cancer cell doesn't have any, any ATP, then of course it's going to die. Question, Question 50. 50. According to the passage, which feature of CTC presents the most significant obstacle to its use as a cancer drug? A, low solubility in hydrophilic media. B, low solubility in hydrophobic media. C, aromatic structure or D electron delocalization. So you mentioned earlier that looking at the structure figure one, that it was going to be hydrophobic, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so I'm guessing that's going to be the answer to this. Um, it, it did say, uh, The structure, right there. It, it says the structure, but it doesn't say what about the structure. So then you have to look at it and, and use your brains and go, oh, I know why that's hydrophobic or hydrophilic or whatever. And so um, now the question is, if it's a hydrophobic molecule, so so let's let's help the students with this. What Looking at this structure, what makes it hydrophobic? Yeah, we have a lot of, we have several here, aromatic rings, you know, those rings of, you know, carbons and hydrogens, they have, de they have delocalized electrons that kind of swim all around them, but ultimately they're made up of nonpolar bonds. They all share their elect electrons pretty evenly. In yeah. fact, so evenly that the electrons aren't actually tied <clears throat> to any particular atom. They kind of swim around the ring, which is what makes these kinds of structures so stable. Yeah. And, and so the, the answer is really, you don't even have to look at the picture if you just want to go structure, structure, right? It's like, yep. what? what's the problem here? Well, the structure is the problem. Well, this is the only one that says the structure is the problem. Yep. But. But. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but. Uh, and this is, this is exactly it. Like, you know, and actually that's why the most common wrong answer on this question is C, because students say, well, oh, well, figure one shows that it has an aromatic structure, which is true. You know, C must be the right answer. Mm -hmm. You know, and you could say the same thing about D, which is, oh, what do aromatic structures entail? You know, almost definitionally, aromatic structures have electron delocalization. So why isn't D the right answer as well, if C and D necessarily go together? Mm. And it's because this question is asking us, what's the obstacle? Like, yes, C and D are both true, but what property do those two things together that lend to the molecule that make it a barrier? It's not like your body looks at it and says, oh, aromatic structure. Sorry, <laughs> like, I would rather keep the cancer. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's what, what properties to the molecule do C and D both lend it? Yeah. Which in this case, is its solubility behavior. This is a hydrophobic molecule, which means that it's not going to be able to dissolve very well in hydrophilic media because, you know, to, for it to get into cells, it needs to dissolve in your blood and it needs to dissolve in the cytosol of your cells. Both of those liquids are almost entirely water, which is a hydrophilic medium. So the right answer here is A. That's what I was gonna say, definitely. A. Yeah. Good. God yeah, I, I love I love this I love this question because I love a lot of questions. Can you say, I like the MCAT. Uh, <laughs> Couldn't tell. Um, yeah, I like this question a lot because it forces you to distinguish between the property and the um, 
it, it forces you to distinguish between the structure and the like kind of description of the molecule from the property that is actually the barrier. You know, your body doesn't care that the electrons are, delocal, are delocalized. You know, what actually, you know, the actual limitation here is that is that quality stops it from dissolving in your blood. All right, question 51. If necessary to design a new experiment, which of the following best explains why researchers could use measurements of intracellular lactate levels in cancer cells to assess efficacy of cancer drugs? Ooh, so I'm trying to think. Lactate is a, another form of metabolism kind of endpoint, right? Uh, obviously an anaerobic uh, if I remember yeah. correctly, anaerobic metabolism, we get lactate, which is why we have lactic acid buildup when we have short bursts of, of things where we can't use aerobic metabolism. So this is really stretching my uh, remembering my exercise physiology days in, in yeah. undergrad. Uh, so, yeah, so that makes sense. All right. So, yeah. So if we yeah, anaerobic yeah. metabolism, also known as. I don't know. Fermentation. Oh, okay. Which was name dropped in the passage. Yeah, and I highlighted it right there. Malignant cells rely more on fermentation than normal cells. So they're kind of as part of their high metabolism, they're using anything possible to to create more energy because they're just yeah. going crazy. It's called the, the Warburg effect in cancer as a fun content fact. All not right. ne not, necess not necessary for the MCAT. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So why researchers could use measurements of lactate levels? All right, so answer choice A, high intracellular lactate levels would indicate that glycolysis is significantly inhibited. B, low intracellular lactate levels would indicate that glyco glycolysis is significantly inhibited. C, high intracellular lactate levels would indicate that the pentose phosphate pathway is significantly limited, inhibited rather, uh, and D low intracellular lactate levels would indicate that the uh, pentose phosphate pathway is significantly inhibited. So how do we assess efficacy, right? Very similar to looking at uh, table one, right? If we were to go to table one, we were looking at ATP for efficacy of the drug. And mm -hmm. we would assume that lactate levels would be high in cancer cells because it's relying on that fermentation that we were talking about earlier. Um, and if a cancer drug would work on that cell, <clears throat> then those lactate levels should drop. So we want low intracellular lactate levels. And so that gets rid of answer choice A and C right off the bat. Yep. So now we're 50-50. Now the question is, is it because glycolysis is significantly inhibited? Or is it because the pentose phosphate pathway is significantly inhibited? And now I am scared that, oh wait, is anaerobic, <laughs> does anaerobic uh, metabolism, aka fermentation, is that glycolysis <laughs> or is that not? And now I'm scared. Um, oh man, I, I want to say that glycolysis is, that's not it and it's answer choice D, but I'm scared to say that. Yeah. I think always with these questions, it's so easy to narrow it down to the last two and then get get scared and start overthinking it. <laughs> yeah, certainly if I were going through this, I you know I feel like I've had to train myself for so long out of like overthinking that I would just I'd be like, ah, oh, this pa this passage is about glycolysis. What? Why would it be D? Irrelevant. Uh, and of course, you know, if there's some nuggets of content that you're missing, then actually it might be D. But yeah, in this case, the answer is B. Yeah. Low ILL would indicate that glycolysis is significantly inhibited. Yeah. Uh, the pentose phosphate pathway, also known as the pentose phosphate shunt, is a kind of separate pathway that diverts some sugar, some six carbon sugars away from general metabolism in your cells so that they can be converted into 
uh, pentose sugars to make nucleotides uh, and also to um, regenerate uh, NADPH, which is a really important um, biosynthetic molecule in your cells. All righty. I overthought that one. But, I, I got scared. But in this case, yeah, but in this case, the pentose phosphate pathway is entirely irrelevant to this pass to this passage. It's in general a very low yield area of the MCAT, but yeah. is sometimes still tested. Uh question 52. According to the experimental results, which enzyme is most sensitive to inhibition by CTZ? So we have A glucose, B glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase, C PFK, and D HK. And we saw PFK there was should be there should be one answer choice that we can just eliminate immediately. Uh, oh, one is not an enzyme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one is one is glucose. <laughs> yeah, yes, glucose is not an enzyme, so we can get rid of that. Okay, I'm glad I glad I realized that. Um, so PFK was inhibited we assume that's what the decrease there from 1 to 0.62 and 0.64 is saying hey it was inhibited uh, by both the nano encapsulated and unencapsulated unencapsulated and hk was only affected really by the nano encapsulated and so i would say that pfk is most sensitive because it was inhibited by both the nano and unencapsulated. Yeah, yeah, and I'd be, I'm inclined to agree with you there, which is presumably the unencapsulated version, if it's still doing some inhibiting, means it can get into the cell somehow, even if it's in a very small quantity because it doesn't dissolve very well in aqueous solution. But that means even if that tiny amount that got through knocked out what looks like, you know, 35% of the activity of PFK, Presumably, PFK is the one that is most sense is most sensitive to inhibition here. All right, another passage in yep. the books, and this is time to sit back, take those breaths, forget about the previous passage, and move on to the next one. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there's yep. more. There's always there's always more MCAT. <laughs> 